Hello, my name is Wendy Van Norden and I'm a leader with the Sierra Club and I would like to take you to the Galapagos Islands. This is my second video. In the first video, I was talking about the geology, the formation of the islands, and in this one, I'm going to be talking about evolution. The Galapagos Islands, about 13 small islands, 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. And that was a perfect location for the creation of new species. And it was here that Charles Darwin picked up samples that would later lead him to the theory of evolution. One of the animals that Darwin was intrigued by is this fellow, a marine iguana. Now, if you go to the mainland in Guayaquil, you'll find lots of iguanas. These iguanas are not too different from their ancestors who were around hundreds of millions of years ago. But on the Galapagos only, you find a marine iguana. They've only been around for four or five million years and they can be found nowhere else. These are pretty interesting critters because they are the only ocean going lizards in the world. They dive off the coast and eat lots and lots of seaweed. But of course, when they eat seaweed, they're going to gulp in a lot of seawater. So what do they do? They sneeze it out. And when you see one of them, you might catch him sneezing, or you'll certainly catch him covered with salty snot. Now they're also black, not to blend in, but because the black color helps them to warm up before their next dive. They are cold-blooded after all. Well, where did they come from? The islands are young, only 5 million years old. So somehow they had to get 600 miles from the mainland. How did that even happen? How did plants and animals ever get all the way to the Galapagos? Well, the fact is very few did. Every plant or animal that made it there was a total accident. Large birds could have flown there. Large marine mammals might have swum there, but everything else was probably blown there by a storm. Small birds from Ecuador blown in, and small animals like iguanas or mice might have rafted across the ocean on a tangle of vegetation. Not a sure thing. If you look at mainland Ecuador, you'll see that it is part of the Amazon rainforest. And the Amazon rainforest has more biodiversity per square kilometer than anywhere else on earth. For example, 1,600 bird species, 16,000 species of plants, 378 reptiles, 6,000 species of butterflies. That's a lot. Galapagos has only 200 species of any kind of animal at all. I guarantee that Long Island has more species of animal than the Galapagos Islands. There aren't any amphibians that made it across and very few mammals. There are very few showy flowering plants. So if you wanna see pretty flowers, don't go to the Galapagos and think about why. Any showy flowering plant would require a nice pollinator. So if a seed landed on one of these barren islands and there were no pollinators around, it was out of luck. So that's why only wind pollinated plants had a good chance to survive there. What are the predators of the rainforest? Well, one is the black caiman that you can sometimes see resting on the side of the rivers. There's the giant anaconda. There's the piranha. There's the jaguar. And my favorite, the giant otter. Now look at this guy. This otter can take down a giant anaconda or even a small jaguar. So beware the giant otter. What are the predators of the Galapagos? There aren't any. None. That's why the animals look at you and don't think that you could be a predator because they have never seen one. You can go right up to animals in the Galapagos and they could care less. They've lived their whole lives without predators. The Spanish sailors called the Galapagos Galapago after the tortoises. They were very good for food. The sailors would pick them up and put them upside down in the holds of their ship and they would have fresh meat for weeks. 
However, that killed off an awful lot of tortoises, especially the females. And not because the females were slower in getting away because um, they're both really slow, but because the females were smaller and one sailor could pick a female up and bring it to his ship. Even Darwin was collecting tortoises, some to eat. And the vice governor of the Galapagos Island told Darwin that he was able to identify the island that each tortoise came from. That ended up being a very important observation. Until that time, Darwin had never thought to identify his, his specimens by island because it didn't occur to him that they were specific to each island. As you may know, Charles Darwin came to the Galapagos on his five-year journey around the world on the Beagle. This book, The Voyage of the Beagle, is wonderful. It's an adventure log. It's a scientific journal. It's a travel log. And it's really, really good. Uh, he made observations. He gathered specimens. And those specimens would later lead to the theory of evolution. And if he were not remembered as a great biologist, Darwin would be remembered as being a great geologist. He was the one who figured out how atolls form. And he was in Chile at the time of an 8.2 magnitude earthquake. And a few days later, he was walking on the beach and he smelled something very bad. It turned out that all of the tide pool organisms were rotting because the land had been uplifted above high tide. He realized that the land had been uplifted, but then he made another leap. He looked up at the Andes and realized those were so far in the air because of numerous episodes of uplift like the one he had just witnessed. It was the mockingbird that first interested Darwin. You've probably heard of Darwin's finches, but the mockingbirds ended up having a similar effect. Mockingbirds are very, very common birds. You probably have some near you. And if you do and live in the North America, it's probably the Northern Mockingbird, the only species we have in North America. But Darwin was astonished to find that there were four species of mockingbirds in the Galapagos and that they were specific to different islands. I never dreamed that islands about 50 or 60 miles apart and most of them inside of each other formed of precisely the same rocks placed under a quite similar climate rising to a nearly equal height would have been differently tenanted, but we shall soon see that this is the case. What happened to create four different species? Well, he also saw this with finches. And no, this is not a Darwin's finch. This is the good old fashioned house finch that might be in your backyard. But he looks very much like most finches around the world, except Darwin's finches in the Galapagos. Look at those guys. Only one of them have the kind of beak that a house finch has and is good for eating small seeds. The other beaks are for eating other plants and animals. This is an example of adaptive radiation. So there was some ancestral ground finch that got blown over to the Galapagos Islands and that finch ate seeds, but there weren't enough seeds to go around. However, in, on the Galapagos Islands, there were no parrots. And if there are no parrots, there's nothing to eat the fruit. So the ground finch turned into a tree finch, which could eat the fruit. And there were no woodpeckers blown over to the Galapagos Islands, but that's okay. A woodpecker finch was developed so he could eat the kind of insects in the wood that a woodpecker would. Now, if you were to put a woodpecker finch against a real woodpecker, that finch would not do well. But there was no competition on the Galapagos, so he did just fine. No warblers, no problem. Create a warbler finch, and so on and so forth. These birds came to the islands and evolved into new species which doesn't answer the question yet, how did they evolve? Well, it was clear they came from the South American mainland. Darwin could see that because he had been to the Cape Verde Islands 
and saw that their species clearly came from Africa. So these colonists were modified into the present species by means of natural selection. Now, the theory of natural selection put forth by Charles Darwin was also put forth by Alfred Russell Wallace. In fact, Wallace coming up with the same theory inspired Darwin to write this book. The two of them presented their papers together, being the very nice Victorian gentlemen that they were. However, we remember Darwin better than we remember Wallace, probably because this book, The Origin of Species, is so well written. What is natural selection? Well, probably most of you know how this works, but I'm going to go through it rather quickly if you let me. You can also fast forward. One, variations exist within a population. No, Darwin didn't know anything about DNA or mutations, but he knew that variations existed. Some variations gave individuals a better chance to survive. And survival was not a given. More individuals are born than can possibly survive long enough to reach the age of reproduction. There is always a struggle for survival. Individual with favorable traits are more likely to survive and pass down their traits to their offspring. Over time, the accumulation of these favorable traits will lead to changes in the population, first to new varieties and eventually to new species. I could say it more succinctly by quoting Charles Darwin. One general law leading to the advancement of all organic beings, namely multiply, vary, let the strongest live and the weakest die. Survival of the fittest. I really recommend that if you ever go to the Galapagos, please go to the Darwin Research Institute on the island of Santa Cruz. It is not only a research institute, but is also an educational institute. It has a fabulous history interpretation center, and on the grounds, it has great critters. Good photographs, guaranteed. The first time I ever saw a Darwin Finch was on the grounds of Darwin Institute. And the science geek in me couldn't be contained. Here it was, a descendant of the birds that gave Charles Darwin the information he needed to create the theory of evolution, one of the most magnificent theories in the world. There are many other wonderful animals on the Galapagos Islands, so please join me in part three, Animals of the Galapagos. Thank you.